Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We are continuing on here with Chapter 9, Key Issue 4, and uh, we are going to look at the big question of why do farmers face sustainability challenges? And we're going to look at some of the challenges that the farmers face in general, whether they're commercial or subsistence. The first thing we're going to look at is how the food trade has changed greatly. Obviously, our amount of food that we produce today is way up. There's way more than enough food for everyone in the world. The idea is trying to get it to the people that actually need it. And so if we look at, uh, if we go back to uh, kind of colonial times, most of food, most of the food in the world was being imported uh, and used by only Europe. It was being taken from the colonies and brought back to Europe at the time. But the population increases have continued in developing regions around the world and has forced those areas to start buying food and, and cultivating more food as well. And so agricultural products have continued to move from the Western Hemisphere to the Eastern Hemisphere. Um, and we're looking at the developing nations that we're seeing in those developing parts of the world are starting to use prime farmland for exporting crops instead of actually feeding the populations of their own people. And that's what we see as a big challenge for those lesser developed countries and those developing parts of the world. Exporting crops to many nations, uh, if we look at like Colombia and Afghanistan, have actually um, been hurt by the increased illegal drug trade as well. So there's all kinds of reasons that we see challenges uh, specifically for developing parts of the world. And we're going to kind of get more in depth on some of those as we go. Here we look at agricultural exports and the increase, and this is global agriculture. So you can see from just 1960 up to uh, roughly today, just how much uh, agriculture and the export of agriculture has increased over the years, right? Quite quite a bit, right, in that, in that amount of time. We also can look at the hemispheric differences here. The United States has dropped from 18% uh, down to 10% of our total exports being uh, agriculture based. But again, we still rank up in that highest category there, the net exporters of $10 billion and above. At one point, the United States was the number one exporting country for agricultural products in the world. Uh, we're hovering in that kind of top five range right now. If we look at what are the agricultural challenges for developing countries, there's a lot of them. And, and maybe some of the biggest problems we see is that there's a massive pr uh, pressure to produce more and more crops every year. If you have a growing population, you need to produce more crops this year than you did last year. And if your population continues to grow, now next year you need to produce more crops than you did this year, and so on and so forth. So that, that's that been really difficult. We see this development uh, and the growing population is really uh, helping to kind of promote development. And they're doing so through exports. They're trying to bring in uh, money by exporting some of their crops. And so they export crops that give them high profit, um, and that that they, they send those to develop parts of the world so they can get money and they can continue the cycle for their economy. However, that doesn't really help feed the people in their own development developing country. We also see gender roles are starting to change. Um, more and more women are starting to practice subsistence agriculture, and we're starting to see men working more paying jobs in these uh, developing parts of the world. Uh, and this is a huge development because if we look at uh, the gender development here, basically a lot of times we're just seeing men working in the farm fields. And so if you just have 50% of the population working to feed 100% of the population, if we can increase the number of people farming, that obviously is going to help everyone in general. Maybe the biggest dilemma that we have here is a lot of land is being used for exporting crops, like we just mentioned, um, and less of it's then being used for cr crops to actually feed the people. And so that is a big problem that these developing countries are having. They're trying to make money to help their economy, but then they're not growing food that the people in their nation actually need. Now they have to export that or import that food, excuse me, from somewhere else. One of the big reasons we see that the farmland isn't being used to feed people is because of drug agriculture and drug agriculture as a trade. Um, lesser developed farmer, country farmers may choose to actually grow things like poppies or coca or uh, cocoa, excuse me, or marijuana. And those are all things that obviously are cash crops. They are used then to uh, go into uh, the market as as illegal drug trade. And so in the developed countries, we start to see a pretty big market for some of these things. Um, we're not counting this as actual agricultural statistics, but if we looked at them, obviously the the uh, the numbers would be astonishing. In Colombia, about half of all of agriculture is actually dedicated to the coca plant, which eventually can be refined down to cocaine. We also see that Peru and Bolivia, very large in the drug trafficking of, of cocaine as well. Afghanistan, in Myanmar, we see uh, poppy fields, and that's uh, eventually can be refined down to the use of heroin. Um, and we see actually at one point in Afghanistan, we've talked about the Taliban, they actually eliminated the use of uh, poppy farming. But uh, since the Taliban's been gone, we've seen uh, an increase in that poppy farming again.
Mexico and Canada, we see the marijuana being uh, brought down into or up into uh, the United States. Um, and we're seeing uh, the United States growth happening as well. And largely because we're seeing in a lot of states that marijuana is becoming uh, legalized now. And so that is going to change some of that a little bit, um, especially when we look at the agricultural uh, trade here. Somalia, we have things like cot leaves, and that's used, uh, it's, it's basically chewed, it's a leaf that's chewed, and it acts as a stimulant. And so we see all this drug trafficking around the world, and it does, it is part of agriculture, but again, it's not, it's, it's an illegal trade specifically, and so it, it isn't actually counted in our agricultural numbers usually. Here's some of the different... Uh, crops we can see here. So on the top left, we have poppies, which again, uh, eventually become heroin or opium. Uh, we have the, uh, the coca leaves in the upper right, which again, can be refined down to cocaine. We have the cot in the right, excuse me, on the left. And then we have uh, marijuana on the right. All right. Here's some of the major drug routes we see a lot of them going into again the more developed parts of the world so leaving uh, regions um, that are maybe developing parts of the world and and heading to like you know north america western europe and so on here so how is agricultural land being lost um, in addition to, we talked about this being a challenge, obviously agricultural land is at a premium and we need the land in order to feed the people. And if you look at agricultural land is our purple line, it's pretty much remained the same um, from 1960 to today. The population has increased during that time. You can see our food, our food production has continued to increase as well. But uh, we can start to see some decrease a little bit in that, that agricultural land as we see more urbanization and urban sprawl starting to occur, as we see the growth of cities. So if we look a little bit more here, the other uh, way we look at land being lost for agriculture a lot of times is this idea of desertification. We talked a little bit about uh, um, some of this a little earlier, not, not necessarily the desertification aspect of it, but the idea that it's difficult to grow crops in a lot of these areas that we look at as being desertified areas. And so if we look at this is the overgrazing uh, or over crop, uh, crop planting and tree cutting in those regions. And so you can see whatever region is kind of the darkest red there, the very high, is a high degree that they are going to lose more farmland to the desert. It becomes a, an area that it, it, you cannot grow crops in. Obviously, the Sahara Desert is the big one there, but you can see Central Asia as well, um, different parts. Of, and again, a lot of times these are desert lands, but uh, you can see on the on the kind of outskirts or the edges or the borders of those those uh, desert areas that we are at a high uh, degree of possibility of losing more farmland to that desert. The desert overtakes that land over time. And so when we talk about how do we improve agricultural productivity, uh, when we look at the developed regions of the world, uh, we talk about this idea of the second agricultural revolution. And this is where we see a lot of new, uh, more, more kind of brand new innovations, things like uh, sp specialized seeds um, or fertilizers and pesticides, um, new equipment and, and new types of practices that are happening. This happens right around the same time as the industrial revolution. And so it allows them to kind of experiment with new versions of trying to create food and crops. And that happens right around the 17th century. All right. Uh, if we look at developing regions, there's been a pressure today to produce more and more food because of the growing populations. Right. And so we look at, um, at one of the ge geographers, you talked a little bit about Esther Basarup, and, and they cite that there are two factors for increased productivity. Number one is new farming methods. All right. So be work being done by a bigger population. Hopefully we'll have more farming methods coming out of that. And number two is leaving fields fallow for shorter times. So allowing fields to rejuvenate and get the, the nutrients back, but shortening the amount of time that you're leaving that field fallow or, or unplanted. So we see we've been able to start increasing productivity. Uh, if you look at the, the herd of, of milk being produced here, the, the herd of, of dairy cattle uh, decreasing from uh, 1960 to today, uh, and you can see the yield actually going up. We're able to produce more milk uh, from less animals. So that's, a, that's, a, that's kind of a big win overall. 
maybe the most influential person in all of this when we talk about increasing yields is the man named Norman Borlaug. And he is known for what we call the Green Revolution. This is sort of uh, the third agricultural revolution. Um, he created and he developed a, a type of high yield seed. It was kind of a hybrid seed. And eventually he brought it to Mexico and India. And India is a really good case study. He, he takes this to India and uh, it, it allowed India's ex, uh, importing, excuse me, uh, to exporting rice. All right, so they were at one point importing rice to, to feed people, and now they were able to start exporting rice in a very short amount of time because of these high yield crops that, that Norman Borlaug uh, created. And so what, what also happens and what works with this is we see a kind of the negative aspect is with this, we see expanded fertilizer use, more nitrogen and ammonia being used from natural gas to increase um, the, the, the yield and, and increase the uh, productivity of the plants. We also see an increase of more machinery being used like tractors and irrigation, and so there are some there are some drawbacks to this uh, this high yield crop that Norman Borlaug has created. But at the same time, uh, again, it's being used to help feed the people that need the, the food the most. So here's the results of the Green Revolution. You can see the number of seeds has stayed pretty steady and actually decreased. Um, the harvest area has pretty much stayed the same, so the area that they're actually using for farmland. And you can see the production and the yield has increased exponentially from 19, uh, basically 1965 up to uh, 2015. All right, so that's where we see these, these massive jumps here when we talk about the, uh, the production of the Green Revolution. Something that kind of goes along with this, this kind of phase that we talk about, this third revolution or third agricultural revolution, is this idea of biotechnology, which really Norman Borlaug kind of started to pioneer a little bit with those high yield seeds that he was creating. But we start to get into the idea of, of GMOs, genetically modified organisms. These are, are living organisms that possess some kind of um, novel combination of genetic material being uh, obtained through some kind of biotechnology. We, we've gone in and, and basically spliced genes together to create a stronger crop or a more uh, pest resistance cr uh, crop or whatever it may be. Um, so if you look at widespread throughout the United States and the world, um, but about 77% of the world's soybeans actually come from GMOs, 90% if we look at the US, 80% of the world's cotton, 90% in the U.S. and 32% of the world's maize or corn actually come from GMOs. And when you look at the, the number there, that's staggering. 32% in the world for corn, 89% of the corn in the United States is a GMO. And, and there's, again, pros and cons. We don't know that much about GMOs yet because they haven't been around that long in order for us to do a lot of research about them. But there, there comes pros and cons, obviously, with both sides. You can see the rise in GMO use here in soybeans, cotton, and corn, uh, basically from the year 2000 and on. Right, you can see just how much the the uh, use of them has risen, specifically in the United States. There are some places in the world that ban GMOs, and so that plays into some of this too. When we look at the criticism here of GMOs, again, some of the critics say, does it does could it bring about health problems? Uh, does it reduce the effectiveness of our antibiotics? Right, that we use. Um, could it cause some kind of damage to the, the ecology of our, our nature, of our climate, and of our biomes. Um, if we look at um, some of the exporting problems, European markets won't buy GMOs. And so the United States um, has a lot of GMO products and the European Union will not buy those. Again, GMOs are not allowed in, in a lot of European countries. And we look at the dependency problems then. Um, this could force uh, specific nations to uh, become more food dependent on undeveloped parts of the world, like the United States. All right, and so if you take a look, uh, GMOs are becoming more, it's, it's becoming more and more common to label them. So you see a product that might be labeled non-GMO. Um, and so you'll see that kind of verified symbol. You're seeing that more and more in the stores today. It's not required in the United States, but there's been a number of bills that have been uh, attempted to be passed in the U.S. to force producers to um, basically label if it's a GMO or a non-GMO product. Of course, the producers say that 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 would hurt their bottom line and that would hurt them overall. Um, but I think it's it's important for most of us. We want to know what we're actually eating. Is it is it organic? Is it GMO? What is it? So here's the U.S. and Canada. Again, we are not required to label our GMOs, but all those purple countries around the globe, they do. They are requiring that anything that's a genetically modified organism has to be labeled. Okay, and I'm going to break it to you here, guys. If you're getting a strawberry that's like the size of an apple, that's probably a GMO. 
All right. That's not a normal strawberry. Normal strawberries are pretty little. All right. So we see a lot of these gin ginormous fruit and vegetables and things that we get. A lot of those are genetically modified in some way. And it's not necessarily what we're talking about with, with increasing yields necessarily. It may make them sturdier or stronger in, in different climates and things. Okay. We also look at uh, agriculture that could be more sustainable. And when we talk about sustainable agriculture, we talk about organic farming. Only about 1% of the world's farmland is actually based on organic farming, but it's starting to go up more and more. Uh, we do see with organic farming, there's basically three big aspects. Number one, you have to limit the use of chemicals. You're not using herbicides or pesticides. And when I say limit, you're, you're basically not using any. Um, you're also limiting antibiotics as well for the, the crops. So they are kind of growing on their own. You're using anything that is organic to help them. Um, we also look at um, land management. The, man, the land is managed a little bit uh, more friendly and, and a little bit more uh, sustainable for the environment. They use ridge tillage, like you can see there. They till up the land and they crop. They plant the crops on the top of those little tills. And um, then we also look at a lot of this tends to be um, integrated crop and livestock. So you have mixed crop livestock farming going on in a lot of these sustainable agricultural organic farms. Um, mixed, they have a balanced number of animals for the crops they need, and they also use limited confinement. And we're seeing a lot of restaurants and a lot of um, industry across the, the United States starting to use organic farming. I know Chipotle is a big one that uses a lot of organic farming as well. That's why once in a while there'll be like outbreaks and there'll be oh there's there's a salmonella poisoning at at a uh, at a Chipotle. Well, a lot of times that those kind of things tend to happen. We have cross contamination when it comes to uh, organic farming once in a while. Here's your ridge conser conservation tillage here. You can see the harvesting residue is, is not removed. So you can see if you look at that closely on that picture on the left, you've still got all the old um, crop. Uh, down there and then they just till it all up and they plant the new crops on top and that's again a, a kind of a way for f using fertilizer essentially and protects the ground as well these are all the different organic industries around um, when we look at some of the major companies here uh, that we have and again some of them might look familiar like uh, Hormel or Cargill or Kellogg um, but you probably didn't realize that there are actually organic offshoots of all those different industries and all those different companies there they may not be labeled necessarily as organic um, but the uh, the food processor does have organic brands associated with their their brand as well like Pepsi not a whole lot of or organic uh, aspect to a, a, a Pepsi but if you look down um, they do have two brands that are associated with Pepsi, Naked Juice and Stacy's Pita Chips, probably uh, things that you've eaten or drink at, at some point. The Pita Chips are great. We we'll call these the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. Uh, the Dirty Dozen are the basically the fruits and vegetables that are most pesticide that most pesticide kind of resides on. And so you you want to always buy the Dirty Dozen organic if you can. Um, and if you look closely at it versus the Clean 15, um, the reason that we talk about the Dirty Dozen is because a lot of times you're actually eating the entire product, right? Strawberries and apples and grapes, you're eating the outside of the product, and that's where a lot of the pesticide and herbicide ends up going to. Um, and so it's very very difficult. They're saying that with the dirty dozen, you can't actually clean them. If you were to, to wash them off, they're still they're still dirty. They still contain some kind of pesticide on them. Whereas you look at the uh, the clean fifteen list there, like avocados and pineapples, uh, papaya and so on. You're actually not eating the actual crop. You're eating the inside of it in a lot of cases, or you're unwrapping it, or you're eating part of it. Um, and so it, it tends not to uh, to contain as much of that pesticide even after washing. So if we look at some of the uh, the acres of crops, and these are areas that are being treated with chemicals, you can see pretty pretty abundant, especially in that central portion of the United States. When we look at the uh, the soybeans and the the grain and the uh, the corn farming, here's areas that are treated with fertilizers and soil conditioners. Again, two maps kind of match one another. You can see a, a small shift, but they're both kind of in the same regions. And then here's our acres of organic production. And again, this is going back to 2007. The, these maps aren't updated every year, but uh, if we look at it, you can see that we do have a decent amount. Uh, the one problem with organic uh, farming is you can't have an organic farm across the street from a, a, a typical farm because you can't allow any kind of pollution, cross-contamination from the other farm that might be using pesticides or herbicides to get into the organic farm. Then that farm is no longer organic, and that's the problem. 
One big problem we look at when we talk about some of the challenges that farmers face, specifically when we talk about more developed nations, is overproduction. And we should say, why, why is overproduction a problem? That shouldn't be a problem at all. Uh, but what the problem is, is that a lot of times with U.S. farmers, they produce more than we actually need. And we kind of mentioned that a little bit with milk in Key Issue 3. But the idea is if they produce too much, we have too much supply, and then the demand for that that good may may go down and that then causes prices to go down. And so there are policies that have been put in place by our government to deal with surplus production. And so we talk about um, sometimes the government will pay a, a farmer to plant a rest crop like clover or hay and that allows the land then to rejuvenate the soil and nutrients inside of it uh, for a season. Uh, the government will also put in the subsidization of, of crops and so they'll pay over 20, they actually pay over 20 billion dollars a year uh, for subsidies going to farmers to try to help them and uh, when prices are low they're able to sustain their their production still. We also look at uh, the government a lot of times will, will buy surplus food and then try to sell it or donate it to lesser developed countries around the world. The problem with that is that's actually really difficult. You can't just go drop drop a bunch of grain in Mexico. Um, there, there's a lot of hoops and, and things you have to get get beyond and move beyond and able to actually do that. So you're looking at the number of farms across the United States. So you can kind of see that map there. And then we're looking at here the farms or the percentages of, of farms that have received some kind of government funding. Uh, and so again, we we do fund our agriculture pretty pretty highly, all right, obviously because we are one of the top agricultural countries in the world. So that is one of our uh, one of our important aspects of our our country and our and our government. Here's other ones that have received received some kind of federal program or federal funding. So again, you can see they they pretty much match same. These are each dot represents five hundred thousand dollars being donated or being invested. I should actually say. We also have a few green slides here, uh, some things that Rubenstein didn't really hit at the end of this chapter here. So we talk about some things like informal agriculture. We're starting to see this being done a lot more. This is where people are kind of cultivating their own little small plots of land, um, and it's for their consumption usually at home. But sometimes it's sold as well. Um, we talk about urban gardening as being one of them. So community plots like maybe right on a rooftop or right on an abandoned uh, a lot or something, we see this being done more and more. Um, and so we, we're also seeing this being encouraged in a lot of places around the globe, like China, where uh, they're, they're having some problems um, trying to feed all the people in some cases. And in some places, this, this kind of agriculture is actually discouraged. When we talk about some of the other challenges being faced worldwide, again, we talked about urbanization as being a big one. There are, uh, uh, you know, urban sprawl and urbanization and the population growth has led to over a billion people being malnourished worldwide. And again, we, we've talked about this idea that we have enough food, we produce enough food in the world for everyone. The problem is trying to get it to those people and distribute it to the people that actually need it. And so we talk about this as most cities uh, tend to be situated right on prime agricultural land. Um, and, and that's an issue because obviously that, that, that land is good for obviously the resources. It's one of the reasons why a city grew up there, but the, we, we also still need the, uh, the farmland to feed the people. With uh, population growth, we also need energy. And a lot of crops now are being used for biofuel instead of fuel, or excuse me, instead of food. And so we see this, so this can actually cause some food prices to, to rise. We saw this in 2008 start to happen as well. Corn specifically is a big one. Um, we, we do subsidize corn heavily, but we also um, have started using ethanol in the United States. Um, and and we, use, uh, we use corn to make the ethanol. And so a lot of our corn goes to ethanol um, production as well. And that, that lowers or kind of lowers the amount of, of food that's available then with the corn. We look at some socio-political influences on agriculture. There are some crops that are considered kind of luxury crops. And as incomes rise throughout the world, we start to see more uh, demand for meat and produce and organic crops. And this idea of luxury crops, which are things that we don't need for our survival, but they're things that people like. Things like coffee, tobacco, sugar, cocoa, right? Um, and those obviously are, are things that are important. We look at the idea of fair trade um, kind of influencing some of the practices in these cases. A lot of times Western, uh, the Western diet has has uh, started to increase in these areas. They, we buy a lot of coffee and tea and, and cocoa and, and sugar, and the production of those things has increased as well. All right, we, and when we come to the fair trade, the idea is that we're making sure that the farmers in those lesser developed countries are actually getting paid what they're supposed to get paid versus pennies on the, on the, uh, the dollar here. 
So we look at the pressure, uh, pressure. Some people in the world are pressured to actually grow cash crops versus food. And we're seeing that in different parts of the world, trying to help their economy out, help the country economy. Specifically, cotton, tea, sugar, and coffee are big ones. We just talked about as luxury crops. And there are some countries that influence or, or would like to influence their farmers to grow that rather than subsistence farming and take care of themselves. And so um, the U.S. spends over $10 billion um, in subsidies to help kind of help these growing choices all right, in general. And we also talk about uh, neocolonialism. A lot of times the colonizers of, of an area will, will pressure farmers to grow crops that they want or that they need rather than crops that the people actually need to survive. We can also start talking about this idea of local food and or slow food mo movements. We're starting to see more of this, what we call local wars, where people who are, they, they have kind of the smaller carbon footprint, they want to eat organic or they want to eat locally and support local uh, business and local agriculture versus trying to eat agriculture from all over. So we see this idea of CSAs, community supported agriculture or community gardens, or as we talked about before, urban gardens and farmers markets. Um, so we're seeing a lot more of that, that local food angle. And that leads us to then our with our local food, farmers markets have, have been on the rise. And so talking about farmers markets, uh, we look at local food, again, smaller carbon footprints. Um, we see a lot of sustainable farming methods with this. And again, it, it, it tends to uh, to be perishable. And so it's the ideas of on tuna here, it's perishable, it tends to be fragile. So they transport it quickly to these farmers markets. A lot of times it's fresh, you can get it right. You know, maybe it was even harvested that morning. Um, they A lot of times will have specialized goods and, and people uh, frequent these farmers markets to get the food that they need, specifically when we talk about like urban settings and urban areas. <clears throat> Finally, we also start to look at this idea of vertical farms in these places where we don't have the ability to use farmland, specifically in urban areas. We start to look at aquaponics um, and, and sometimes even using rooftops and warehouses to actually grow food. And so sometimes we, we see fish being used here as well. Um, they'll put tilapia in some of these to help circulate the water. And then the fish excrement is used as fertilizer. And this is a, a type of organic crop. You can actually do this, this aquaponics or hydroponics here. Um, and it's, it's, there's starting to be kind of an on-demand farming that goes with it. You can do this right inside, um, very in a, in, inexpensive, and, uh, and make money off of this, sell this to the places where we need. And again, you can farm anywhere. You can farm in a warehouse, on a rooftop. And so we're seeing more and more of this vertical farming being done too. We've talked a little bit about the idea of food deserts prior to this as well. The idea of food deserts, obviously, areas that are characterized by lack of affordable, fresh, nutritious foods. Um, and so when we get to this idea of food deserts, um, these are areas that are, are lacking grocery stores, essentially. Um, and we've, this comes back um, throughout a couple of the chapters here in our book. Um, but basically, there's only some kind of small market convenience store, and that doesn't have the fresh food, fresh fruit and vegetables that you actually need. And so when we look at a rural standpoint, public transportation can be a factor. But they say if there's not a grocery store within 10 miles, then that would be considered a food desert. Same with an urban area. If there's not a, a grocery store within one mile, then that is considered to be a food desert. And we see connections to obesity rates and diabetes and other health issues when we look at food deserts as well. And we've talked a little bit about Minnesota's food deserts here. So you can see um, food deserts, again, the rural areas all throughout Minnesota. And we can get into the, the urban and suburban areas there. All right. And, and te technically, uh, St. Paul Park and Newport would be considered food deserts because they are uh, more than a mile away from a grocery store. There's no grocery store in those places. There might be convenience stores, but again, they don't typically carry fresh fruit and vegetables and things like that. Here's your others looking at the entire country. And again, this is a major problem across across our country. This is when we talk about hunger. Uh, being an issue in our in our country here as well. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. So hopefully you got everything you needed. If you have any questions, as always, get a hold of your teacher, and we'll see you again soon.